So it's a great pleasure now to introduce my opposite number from the German Astronomical Society, uh, Professor Andreas Burkhardt from Munich. And he's going to talk, us, talk to us about watching a small gas cloud on its way into the central supermassive black hole of the Milky Way. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, we have a similar problem as you have. You know, you never know when things happen, uh, really. Um, and in astronomy, you also have the problem uh, that you make a prediction and it happens after you're dead. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is uh, usually, you know, if you think of the sun, um, do we really know it explodes in five billion years? What happens if it explodes tomorrow? So, so you, you know, so these are the things, uh, the problems. Uh, but once in a while, and this is why I'm standing here, uh, once in a while things happen on a time scale uh, which you, where you still live. Uh, this is good. It's also, also a problem because suppose you messed it up. Uh, it's better you're already dead. When <laughs> this happens. Uh, but in this case, it happens right while we are sitting, standing here and talking. So that's why I think it's, uh, it's something uh, uh, I want to tell you. So, it's about the galaxy. You know, the galaxy is a big disk of 100 billion stars orbiting around the center. And, uh, and the people were always interested to understand what is in, this, in the center. Actually, uh, this is Sagittarius. This is the center. And when I saw this picture, actually, I realized this is perfect for the UK because Sagittarius looks like a teapot to me. Uh, you know, if you look at this. And this is. This is, I think it's called also teapot, isn't it? Uh, there's some, so actually it's beautiful, great. So I got the right topic. Now, you see, the problem with the galactic center is that this veil of, of molecular material, gas clouds and dust clouds in front, which don't allow you to peek into the center in the visible wavelength regime. But basically, it was already Jansky who, who saw the, uh, a, a solution. He had his radio telescope, and he discovered the first radio um, signal uh, from outer Earth. And this radio signal came from the, from the galactic center. He didn't understand it, but he said, OK, maybe if we go to the long wavelength regime or whatever, we might be able to look into the galactic center. That's actually uh, what we are right now doing. And this is an infrared image, and it shows all this whale is gone. And you basically can see the stars. The galactic center is actually brighter than the, the moon in the infrared. And uh, basically, you can look into the galactic center. So this is one of the be most beautiful radio images uh, which I know about the galactic center. And there's a big disk of mo molecular material, about 100 million solar masses of gas, which uh, are in, in, in the central region of about uh, 400 parsecs or parsecs, if you don't remember three light years, and uh, we are not focusing on this kind of um, disk, but we want to focus on the inner part, this kind of uh, bright image, which is a radio shell uh, of a 10 to 6 Kelvin gas, uh, which was produced by, we think, 50 to 100 supernovae that exploded at the same time. Now, this must have been an explosion. Uh, and I, we, I, don't, I don't understand how, how you get this fine tuning, 100 supernovae at the same time exploding, but it obviously happened, and nobody knows. And actually, I, nobody knows. And mysteries, what I will say all the time. Let me tell you the story. I have never worked on the galactic center. I've worked with Donald on, on stellar dynamics and all kinds of things. Never on the galactic center because I thought it's boring. It's a little thing in the middle. Who cares? And then uh, I, I tell you about this little gas cloud. Uh, and then suddenly, everything changed. And now this is the most exciting place you can think of. It's full of mystery. It's full of, full of puzzles, and nothing is understood. So that's uh, why I think it's very good. So we have this hot bubble of, um, of gas produced by supernova. And you see streamers of gas falling to the very center of uh, this region. And by that, actually accelerating to velocities of 1,000 kilometers a second. Uh, not a centimeter per century, a thousand kilometers per second. Uh, a little different. Uh, but still, time scales are long because the universe is big. Uh, you know this. Okay, so we can peek into the center and try to understand what's going on. And if you do this, then you uh, begin to see stars, obviously. Um, 
you see stars when you look out into the universe. Uh, this is a seeing limited image, but if you actually correct for seeing with adaptive optics, then you see the power of adaptive optics. You can look at the, all these individual stars in detail, understand their history and their formation, by this understand how the galactic center formed and what is in the galactic center. So let me peek into this innermost region. This innermost region has a size of about one parsec. So the diameter is one parsec. Now one parsec is something interesting because in the solar neighborhood, the typical distance between stars is one parsec. But here, inside one parsec, there is a cluster of more than two million stars. Now think of this, how dense the regions. You can read the times all the time if you want uh, because it's <laughs> so much so bright over there that there's no problem. Uh, even at night and when it rains, doesn't matter. <laughs> so this is in one part, two million stars in this small region. This is amazing uh, in the following sense. The stars are so close together that they're always interacting. They might actually merge with, with each other. So if you're interested in understanding collision dominated stellar dynamics, go to the galactic center. Something else is quite interesting. This star cluster is slowly rotating in the same direction as the whole galaxy. And the stars have big age spread. They are stars that are as old as the whole galaxy, and then they are young stars. The whole history of the galaxy is visible in this star cluster. In addition, the star cluster has roughly the mass of the central black hole I would, will talk about. So the idea can come up that the star cluster and the black hole have a coordinated evolution. Basically, the, the star cluster always will have the mass of the black hole in the very center. <coughs> And that would be interesting because we can work out the age distribution of the stars, and by that we can work out the accretion history of the central black hole. So this is something exciting. The stars, so, so to say, are indeed uh, very, very old. Now, how a star cluster like that could form is a big mystery because a tip, the typical size of a gas cloud that warms one single star is already as big as, uh, as, as a star cluster. So uh, this. This is a problem. But there's even more to it. Uh, this more is shown here. If you focus into the inner 10% of the star cluster, which is now 0 0.05 parsec, then you see a cluster of young stars. Young means uh, 4 million years. And I can say precisely 4 million years because all of these stars are 4 million years old. And these are not old, um, mass low mass stars. These are young, very massive stars. They are so-called B stars. So masses of several times the mass of the sun. They all formed uh, four million years ago, and they built, they formed this kind of spheroidal cluster of very young stars, uh, which we call the S stars. And this object um, has a size, as I said, of, a, of, of less than a tenth of a parsec. And as I said, one single cloud forming one single star is much larger than that. So how these S star forms is even more problem than understanding the cluster here. Uh, or maybe the same problem, I don't really know. It's, well, you can choose which problem you want to solve. Uh, it's both uh, um, not completely understood. And if you now focus on this inner star cluster, uh, then you can do, a full, and look, and do the following observation. So this is the innermost star cluster, the innermost stars which sit right in the center of the galaxy. And this is not an animation <coughs> produced on the computer. This is a real observation. So for the first time, you see stars moving. If you don't, if you think they are holes in the sky, it's over. They are moving. <laughs> is it? Uh, and these stars move quite fast. These have masses of 10, 20, it times the mass of the sun. And they move with velocities of 2,000 kilometers a second. And you see, they don't cross the galactic center on the linear path. They are deflected around something. Uh, uh, this red cross is an observation uh, uh, this, uh, we put in. We should have left it out. It's much more exciting if you see nothing. Uh, if, if you think how much force it takes to deflect the star, uh, there must be something very massive uh, in the very center. And so we know, basically, there's a black hole of four to the six solar masses. And we have at least one star where we have now full orbit, this S2 star, and so we can measure the mass of this central black hole with high precision 
of its 4.326 solar masses. We also measure the galactic center, the distance to the galactic center with high precision. Everything can work. We work out uh, like that. Well, the interesting thing is, if you know the black hole, then you know a sphere of influence, which we call the Bondi radius, <laughs> inside which nothing can form, because the black hole tears everything apart. And this sphere of influence is just exactly the size of this inner star cluster. So it's a contradiction. Yeah. How can the massive stars form in a region where massive stars can't form? You can say, I bring them in, but these massive stars are only a few million years old. You need to be fast to bring them in. And then you need to slow them down so that they stay in. Uh, you know, it's a, a puzzle, let's say that way. So this star cluster shouldn't exist. Uh, so um, OK, but this is not all. There is something else around this star cluster. Uh, around the star cluster, there is a ring of O stars. So the star cluster is made of B stars. And outside of this star cluster of B stars is a ring of O stars, about 50 O stars. They are all in a circle moving around the center. And they have an inner sharp edge, which is exactly this Bondi radius. Inside this edge is the spheroid star cluster of B stars. And outside is this fast rotating ring of O stars. Uh, OK, puzzle. So, um, another puzzle is why we don't see the black hole. I told you about all this gas sitting in the center. And black holes are one of the brightest objects in the universe. Actually, if you count the number of photons in the universe, uh, neglect the, the Big Bang, the, the microwave background. It's due to black hole accretion. <coughs> and this black hole in the Milky Way is not visible despite all this case. So what's going on? Why isn't the black hole active? Uh, we believe it might be because inside the Bondi radius, where we have all these S-stars, there is a gas clump, uh, there's gas of 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Very, very hot gas secreted by the black hole. And this is actually wh wh what Jansky was seeing. Uh, it's basically um, the, the, the radiation of the, of, of the free electrons in the magnetic field of this very hot gas, which generated the radio emission of Jansky. And there you have this very hot bubble, and maybe that's the reason why the black hole can't accrete, because it has only ga cold, hot gas around it, which can't help. Okay, so that was the situation. And uh, then, uh, that was before I was interested in this whole thing. And then, uh, I'm working at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics with my colleague uh, Reinhard Genzel. And uh, we, uh, we usually meet in Santa Cruz, California, because in, at Max Planck we never meet. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but you see yourself for coffee, sometimes also tea, and, uh, but this is it, you never talk. So in California, you meet and think about science. And so Reinhardt came to me in California and said, Andy, I have something new for you. Do you want to have a look? I said, sure, I always like. He said about the galactic center. I said, well, galactic center, I'm not really interested in. But he said, okay, look at this. And so I looked into it. And he said, look, I have something here. This is an object moving towards the black hole. The black hole is here, the object moves with one to 2,000 kilometers a second towards the black hole. It's very exciting. I said, Reinhardt is not exciting. I know about these stars already. Uh, they said, no, this is not a star. And then he showed me a spectrum. He could make a spectrum. I can't go into any details. This is a spectrum which he has. And he determined the temperature. And these massive stars have temperatures of 10,000 K and more. And this object has a temperature of 500 K moving in the, on such an orbit towards the black hole. So it can't be a star. Then I said, Reinhard, well, it becomes interesting. What can move towards the, uh, the black hole with such a small temperature? Well, it is a gas cloud. It's a small, little gas cloud. The temperature is a few hundred Kelvin in the dust. It's an ionized gas cloud, so you basically you can demonstrate for the H. For the hydrogen gas, it's 10 to 4 Kelvin. The dust has a lower temperature as usual. This is typically <coughs> so-called H2 region. And that's why for the dust has a 600 Kelvin temperature, but the hydrogen gas, which is inside this gas cloud, is 10 to 4 Kelvin. It's ionized. Uh, we know the luminosity, so we can work out the mass of the gas cloud. And then when I saw this mass, I said, Reinhard, you're crazy. Uh, this is impossible because it's just three Earth masses. And you, how can you see a three Earth mass object in the galactic center? I, I never had heard this. An, an observer is a genius. I have to say, that's maybe I didn't make it. And I became a theorist. Because they are three Earth mass 
gas cloud of 10 to the 4 Kelvin moving through an environment with 10 to the 8 Kelvin in the tidal field of a black hole inside the Bondi radius, happily moving towards uh, the galactic center. It's like you going through the Sahara and suddenly seeing a snowflake uh, coming. It's impossible, but it's, it's so that's, that's the puzzle. So, so what is it? Well, the first thing, and I tell, tell you, this is something I learned quickly. The first thing is, when you write a paper about it, you have to give it a name. And I tell you, this is more problem than the whole science. How do you call it? You cannot write down a little gas, the little gas cloud falling into the black hole all the time. Think about the page charges, not nothing, not <laughs> and so on. So you need to come up with an abbreviation. Okay, we thought about things, and then we said it may be G, uh, because there are stars in this very center called Esther. So. G for gas. But okay, then G1 is boring. <coughs> and then I was playing class Scrabble, and then I saw G2. And so we called it G2. So this gas cloud is called G2. Uh, because maybe you maybe you is won't see a G1. So so this was something. So the first thing what we did is we worked out the orbit. And this is this is the biggest puzzle of all. This is the orbit of G2. So um, it came, it has a very, very high eccentricity. It's almost radially falling in. The orbital period is 400 years. And uh, it started just exactly at the time when the Royal Astronomical Society was <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I don't know. It's, it's a puzzle. Yeah? Yeah, OK. So. So it's basically right now, it's, it, it, this was when it was discovered, and right now it's actually moving around the black hole and falling into the black hole. That's why it's exciting. Everything happens now in months, time scales, and maybe the black hole will, uh, will become active. This is something what, why, we are, why we are looking and why we are so interested in that. There are many questions, of course. What are the properties? Orbital periods, where does it come from? Where will it go? And what will happen to the black hole? Will Become, will be for the first time seeing a black hole becoming active, generating jets or whatever <coughs> in up. So the first thing is we, we calculated, simulated the, the evolution of the gas cloud. And we had a big problem because when we started out there at our center, we never could do it. The gas cloud was disrupted before it ever got close to the black hole. Uh, so we thought of a new model where we started magically popping the gas are popping out of nowhere in the middle of the hot bubble. And it's, it's nice, fair to shape because you don't want to fluff it up and it's gone again. We were not very happy with this, but ESA wanted a press release and they wanted uh, a movie. Uh, so we had to make a movie. So this is a movie which you now find everywhere. If you go to the web, you always see this movie. It starts with unreasonable initial conditions, but it is the best that works. And you see what happens. So this. The gas that formed somewhere in the whole bubble out of nothing, as I said, it now gets closer to the black hole. It should be shredded uh, by the black hole right now. This is now while you sit here. And then it should begin <coughs> to feed the black hole. And the black hole should become active in the next 10, 20 years. That's something predictable. I still am so, uh, alive, hopefully, by the time, if that ever happens. Now, um, I have to say we sent this to nature. And nature accepted it and said, ah, we want to make, uh, put, put the G2 on the front page. And then I said, we don't have a working model. Uh, I love nature. It's always a pleasure. And nature said, no, you make it happen. Otherwise, you don't get the front page. <laughs> of course, <laughs> you, you, you make it. So that's what we did. <laughs> so it's on the front page. But we, know, we were a little uncertain because this is one model. It doesn't, it's not the right initial condition. But if nature calls. <laughs> <You are. laughs> That's amazing. Sure. Uh, and they had another little mistake. They said the giant gas cloud. Uh, and, and I told you it's a little gas cloud, but anyway, they wanted a giant gas. Well, okay, for if you look at, at the clouds in the sky, it's a little larger than this. Uh, but three Earth mass not really. So, okay, so this was all a lot of fun, but we haven't yet understood what uh, what it does. Our prediction was it will be torn apart, and then it will do something feeding the black hole. And indeed, this is what we are seeing. These are two images. You see here the line of sight velocity. Here you see the position, the distance from the black hole. This is the orbit projected on the sky. And you see the gas cloud was indeed torn apart over the last years. 
And actually, if you look at the newest data, you see the gas has been torn apart, moving around the black hole, and we see something appearing on the other side. So indeed, it's now spaghetti as we predicted. Now, this is not really, uh, this is trivial. Uh, so to say, the prediction is not, uh, some, you, you can't give me the Nobel Prize for that because it's uh, obvious yeah, that it will, it will do something like that. So this is something which, uh, and now comes, of course, the question, what will happen to the black hole and what happens to the cloud itself? Uh, well, um, this is um, a good question. Also, where did it come from? Now, if you look at the orbit of this gas cloud, you see it forming, falling in, <laughs> becoming elongated. And you might see something appearing here on the left side, along the orbit, something new coming up. And we got interested in that, and we looked it into this, and we found a little stream of dust falling in towards the black hole. And, and, and it might all be accidental, projection, but it might be that this stream is feeding little bullets towards the black hole on a similar orbit, so we might have a G2 or G3 coming up uh, or not. So these are things uh, which we are now exploring. We still haven't solved the question. If the gas cloud comes from out there, it should evaporate. It should disappear appear long before it has reached the galactic center. We haven't solved that. Uh, another idea came up that maybe the gas cloud is pointing us towards something which is in the center. Maybe the gas cloud is a visible envelope of a source, an anchor, a source which might be a star which is evaporating, being disrupted or so on. And we did a simulation to see whether this is actually working. Um, and here you see the simulation. The, the, the star is moving towards the center. At some point, the tides become very important and then everything is very, it becomes very elongated. If some of the things work better in this case, other things do not work at all. It's much too bright, for example, compared to the observations. And if you have two gas clouds, which you now see falling in, you need two stars on exactly the same orbit, which is, which is the likelihood is zero. So to say that this doesn't make sense at all. A, a, a way to distinguish will be after the fact. When the gas cloud is generated by a source, as soon as it moves around the central black hole, um, all this gas falls into the black hole itself but the source will go on an orbit again. And you see, you would begin to see the source or new gas cloud coming up, and that might be an indication in the next 10 years that there's something in the center, but we don't really know. So, uh, of course, most important for observers is what will happen to the black hole. Uh, the observers couldn't wait. So they already now, I have to say, not, maybe not waste, but invest a lot of observing time before the fact because the gas cloud initially has so much ang ang momentum and energy that nothing falls into the black hole. It first has to go around, and then over you need to wait 10 years, and then you decelerate the gas and it falls in. So our hope is that maybe uh, in the next couple of years, the black hole will generate an accretion disk, an accretion disk will form around the black hole, and then uh, maybe uh, the black hole becomes active. It's, the problem is three Earth masses. If 10% falls in, how do much do you see? Yeah. It's like old faithful. I have been in Yosemite recently. You know these guys, the geysers, yeah? The old faithful type. Some are unpredictable. They are the most fun part. But you go there, you sit there for an hour, you get bored, you, call, you get yourself a cup of tea, and while you go away, suddenly it happens. <laughs> and, and everybody has seen it, and you, you haven't seen it. That's the problem with this black hole. We have only limited amount of observing time. And if some chunk of material from the cloud falls in, and then generates a little mini jet. And Reinhardt was looking, uh, so Reinhardt wants us to precisely determine when the mini jet will occur. <laughs> but this is uh, turbulence, unpredictable. Okay, but this is a life of theory, so you always have to make this term. <coughs> so I hope I, I have whetted your appetite for the Galactic Center a little bit. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
a diffuse gas spaghetti, which is then by hydrodynamic instabilities uh, basically dissolving. It is not, it's, it's not a solid material, and the gravitational field of the, of, the, of the black hole is much too strong to allow it to intact, kind of go, uh, go uh, back to upper center. That's at least in all the simulations which we have been doing. And the mixing with, and the evaporation with the hot surrounding is preventing this. If you have a, a central source, it is a different story, but then it's also not true Michalevi. But, but of course, the analogy is right in the sense people were making prediction what they will see when uh, Jupiter Levy falls into uh, Jupiter. And uh, yeah, so this is something uh, on the similar time scale. Even, even if it's solid the first time it goes around, if it's a star the first time. Uh, it, well, the first time, if it is a star, well, it is unlikely that it's, you know, this is an orbit of a thousand years. We would have, the star would have had to form a thousand years ago, would have been, and this is a very unlikely uh, condition, given the fact that another one is already being seen. Scattering stars exactly in the same orbit is also very unlikely. Uh, but something must be right. It's, it's somehow worked. Yeah. So. Martin, all the way at the back. Yes, thank you. Um, is there a prediction? Where's the microphone, Martin? Uh, yeah. Is there a prediction that we might see uh, radio emission? Obviously, that not attenuated by dust if it is radio. And if so, if we can persuade G2 to hang on until SKA is available, sure. that will be uh, monitoring <laughs> sure. the whole time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I th yeah, well, there are pr predictions of all kinds, depending on the model you use. And of course, there's radio emission from, from, the, from, from the accretion disk. Whether it's visible, given the hot radio, the, all this hot gas in the surrounding is another question, so it depends on how much is falling in, the accretion rate. We think it, the, 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 there should be a factor two to three increase in, in luminosity when you focus on the central region. So, but you don't know when it happens, and the orbital time scales become very short. So, just devoting a whole of SKA wouldn't no, would no, not be. It, but but it's virtual. and actually, if that happens, and I come to the UK because you know Germany <laughs> left, uh, so uh, because yeah, that's one of the problems. How far out is the pericenter relative to the event horizon of the So the, uh, the pericenter is 2,000 Schwarzschild radii, currently estimated. And then, of course, when the gas loses angular momentum and energy, then it goes very, very close, basically. Hmm. It can easily hit. 2,000 Schwarzschild radii is already very, very close. That's why the cloud doesn't survive. Uh, no, that's why nothing will go out to upper center anymore. Uh, just yeah. simply torn apart. And getting it that close is a big problem because, you, you know, if you're sitting out there at, uh, at two-tenths of a parsec, how do you really know precisely what the black, where the black hole sits and how you make a cloud without any momentum? It's basically zero momentum so that it reaches pericenter with 2,000 Schwarzschild. It's a big question because everything in the surroundings is rotating. I told you yeah. at this disk, so why isn't the cloud rotating like, like the rest or why doesn't it uh, gain angular momentum? while moving through the rotating environment. So it's, yeah. Paul, have you had a question? Are there any other examples known of uh, gas clouds of this size isolated in the galaxy? No, that's, but we expect probably someone has seen something, that's why we call it G2. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I, I think that's probably a good note to finish this. <laughs> Thank Andreas again for a wonderful